Now I know some draw three problems. Emission failure is caused by problems on modification and transmission. Final draw. Incorrect tire size. Okay, here's the thing. It says a torque converter that continually locks and unlocks may create a symptom very similar to an engine misfire or a surging condition. One good way to tell if the torque converter is the issue is to drive the vehicle until the problem happens. All right. So, in other words, this saying this: if you got a car, they, if they if they give you a situation, if you're driving down the street, or the cars at high speed and start to surge or misfire, you got and you're trying to determine if it's a ignition misfire, fuel misfire, or sometimes a transmission misfire, you think like a torque converter, light while it's surging. Lightly touch the gas pedal. If it goes away, it's something going. It's something going on with the lock-up torque converter. All right. So when the brake pedal is depressed, the switch tells ECM or TCM to disengage to unlock or unlock the converter. Also, oversized wheels and tires would get the wrong speed. That can cause a shifting problem. Also, let me see something. Oh yeah, back on this one, the torque converter. And don't forget also that the temperature sensors, speed sensor, gear position. Gear position uh, and on the back transmission as well as input signals. So all these are input signals. If they off, the transmission is not going to act right. It may shift wrong, all right. It might stall and drive. So remember, that input signal is a also cause the transmission to act erratic. With any of these sensors. Okay, uh, the original equip. The original equipment exhaust systems are designed for the best combination exhaust flow with slight back pressure. Necessary for exhaust gas recirculation, EGR operation. Now, this is what this is. Here's an EGR. Okay. Now, this is just a back pressure type. Okay. The back pressure type, I can apply vacuum to this valve. Unlike a conventional EGR, you can apply vacuum to it. And, the, and this diaphragm here will lift up and the car will stall or stumble, which it's supposed to do. That indicates the valve works and the, and the exhaust ports or intake ports are cleared. Yes. Okay. On this one, this one right here, if I apply a vacuum here, there's an internal bleed here. It's going to bleed off. This diaphragm will never lift up because we have no back pressure. Okay, that's why you're talking about the back pressure on your exhaust system. Some people ain't change their muffler and install a clear flow muffler that affects the back pressure on the exhaust. That can affect the EGR, which affects NOx. So now, to get this EGR valve to work, we need back pressure. You can see here on this one, we're going to get exhaust back pressure going this way, coming up this way, going up to beneath this diaphragm. It's going to push up, to, push up on it and close this internal vent. So now when we apply a vacuum to it, this system is sealed, unlike this one. This one has a bleed in it. It's going to bleed off. But since we got back pressure now, it's going to push this up, close that vent. Now when vacuum is applied here, the diaphragm now is going to lift overcoming this spring. And I actually lift the pinto up here and help reduce NOx. So here we got a vacuum, the diaphragm, back pressure, overcoming the spring for this to work. So under what conditions would you have that back pressure? Just driving down the street. Just okay. driving. Yeah, just driving down the freeway. 45 miles an hour, you, you build up back pressure and exhaust. Right, uh, diameter to a larger pipe R. Relocating the mufflers and converters can upset the exhaust flow and back pressure requirements. That's what I was talking about earlier. Any change in the EGR operation caused by exhaust system modifications can lead to increased NOx. For example, like I said, somebody might be a, put a clear flow muffler on the car, reducing the back pressure, and the EGR valve won't work. I have seen that in a shop at the school. Matter of fact, I didn't even catch it when the students caught it. Emissions and the engine pinging cause the EGR valve doesn't work. Uh, 
Because each of our is a principal method is used to control detonation. Detonation causes knocks. So if the eavesdropper doesn't work, you get a pinging noise. Get a pinging noise, and knock sensor kicks in. And knock sensor kicks in, and retards the time you had no power. So think about what I just said. You can have a car, they can ask you a question. A car has no power for back pressure eavesdropper system on it. They can give you a list of reasons what can cause that. They might say an improper muffler, uh, a uh, modified exhaust system. You th and then you think, how can a modified exhaust system cause a lack of power? Based off, each other valve not working, pinging, then knocks us a kick scent and retards the timing. You get that? Yeah. All right. So people won't, won't pick that answer. Like, how can that cause it? Because it's a, it's a muffler or exhaust yeah. system. That's how. A back pressure to activate the, the EGR. Exactly. The temperatures in the, uh, in the combustion chamber would go up, would rise, and that would cause the detonation. Exactly. Remember, you got always think about when they ask you a question on the test. You got you always got to think about the root cause. Remember, it's a diagnostic test, so you got to think about the root cause of the problem on the ASC test. A plug cowling inverter or other restrictions in the exhaust system will increase exhaust back pressure, which can lead to several drawability complaints. One is a lack of power, or no start condition. Most noticeably, the vehicle will lose power and perform sluggishness. Sluggishly. I can't get the word out. Low vacuum at 3,000 RPM. You, you uh, use a vacuum gauge to catch that. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Most tests talk about vacuum gauge, right, to catch it. The best way, in my opinion, opinion to catch it is the back pressure gauge. I think all these years, I thought I think I caught it one time for vacuum gauge. And uh, guess what? The, the code was for the air injection system because it was pushing exhaust back up into the air pump, right? And the code was for the air injection. The customer complained about a check engine light and no power. And the check engine light was air injection system. Now, obviously, think about this on the test. An air injection system cannot cause a lack, of, usually won't cause a lack of power, okay? But a plugged exhaust system can and since the air injection is hooked up to the exhaust, it can throw the air injection code. You see how the root cause of the problem is? That's, that's why I'm talking about the root cause. So it so says excessive reading with, the, with a back pressure gauge, usually two to 3,000 RPMs, seven PSI, claw cat or muffler. It's usually somewhere around two, two, two and a half. That's normal. Yes. You start going over two, that's a problem. And that's a, and, and every time I had a plug exhaust system, the gauge picks up, the back pressure gauge picked up right away. I seen some cars at idle it had two PSI, so you knew it was bad. At idle it was supposed to be zero. And soon you give it gas, it went to like seven. What's wrong with this picture? How can you how can you see ex excessive back pressure on this picture? Well, one of the things is you have a ridge condition. Okay. The, the O2 sensor is telling you. Right. Uh, so yeah, it is reading rich. Okay, that's true. Anything else? And then let's see. The vehicle speed is going at twenty five. Um. Seems like the 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 map. The reading on the map is high. There you go. That's what I want you to see. That. Yeah, the, the reading on the map meaning there's uh, back pressure in the. Uh, right. So look at this. You, you and you did it correctly. Very, very good on this too. Look at this. This car's only going at 25 miles an hour, like you picked up. Right. Like assume as pressing on the gas pedal to try to get this car to move. That's why the TPS is so high. But at 25 miles an hour, there's no way we should have this much back pressure that's really high now the reason I wrote this over here guess what we can have a car and it can actually do this on ASC test also we can have a car at the same symptom no power at all the same exact symptom no power but the clue here is this they might actually is it fuel related right mass airflow problem 
uh, back pressure. If you look at this slide here, right, it's definitely not fuel related. So now I'm looking for something in a mass airflow problem or a back pressure problem. What you found out, what you found. Now you see I took this, I took the same slide and actually two or three different questions. Right? But yet, see, here's the thing though. This probably won't be this high of a lean condition. This probably won't be that high though. So that was the clue here on this one. And this one is not fuel. And this tell me it's not fuel related. If I had a car that had a lack of power, at the same, say I was at 55 miles an hour and I had a lack of power and this says 100 and dropped down to 100 millivolts. It's, it's extremely lean. It's extremely lean. All right, be careful. It's extremely lean. Okay, so now I'm not looking for an exhaust problem. I'm looking for a fuel related problem, a mass airflow problem. But you picked it correctly. This one has a back pressure problem and this, picks, and this map sensor picks it up. So and this at that speed and at that rate of acceleration, what would be the normal reading for the map? Maybe one and a half to two. Okay. Now here's another one. An exhaust leak upstream from the O2 sensor may draw air into the upstream. I'm sorry, into the exhaust stream and cause erroneous O2 sensor signals. Now, what do you think the signal would be in this situation? Um, it would be lean. Lean. That's the signal they're talking about. This would give a false lean, lean condition and the computer would respond rich. Okay. This is, now, here's, here's the other thing also. Now, when they say this, remember this. Here is the exhaust. Oops, that's the cat. And here's the O2 sensor. Keep this in mind too. Here's my here's my exhaust leak here. They're talking about. That's the exhaust leak they're talking about. Air is going in this way. So right, right before the right before the right before the O2 sensor. That can cause the car to go rich, cause it sees a lean condition. Okay? Now, don't get this confused with this. The exhaust leak is over here behind the O2 sensor, but in front of the cat. That will cause a high NOx. Because remember, this front bed reduces NOx. The front bed re reduces NOx, and it needs CO. With the, with the polonium to work to help restrict oxygen into an O2. <clears throat> if it gets too much oxygen, it's not going to work. Yeah, and oxygen is going to increase. Okay, the O2 is good for oxidation of ACs and CO, CO back here because ACs and CO is oxidized back here. That means adding oxygen to the fuel molecules. It's good back here, but it's very bad up here. <clears throat> so before the O2 sensor, I can get a false lean condition and cause it to run rich. After the O2 sensor before the cat, I can get an increase in O2 cause NOx to increase. This in turn can lead to incorrect air fuel mixture controlled by the PCM and may cause the system to drop out drop out a closed loop into an open loop operation. And again, false lean condition, rich correction. Okay. Now, if it gives a rich correction, what emissions could elevate because of this? This kind of condition. What do you think would elevate all the four gas or five gas analyzer respond with this type of condition? What do you think is going to happen? Uh, high, uh, hydrocarbons? Hydrocarbons will go up also, but guess what? That will follow... That will follow the CO. Because remember, this is going to... Right here, risk correction, there's a chance to add so much fuel, the CO will go up first. Then hydrocarbons go right behind it. 
So you might have a situation when the car is running rich. 3.5%. Something like this. I'll make up the numbers. And parts per million in the ACs. Because of a situation like so. Like this condition. A false lean condition. O2 sensor to total computer is lean. So the computer is going to respond by adding fuel. And I remember, if it keeps seeing all that air, it never sees the rich condition. So they're going to keep adding and adding, adding fuel until they try to get the O2 sensor to start switching again. But the O2 can't switch because it sees all this oxygen in front of it because of the exhaust leak. No, reverse it. Carbon monoxide goes up on the rich condition and hydrocarbons will follow it. Okay. Right, think about this. Uh, on a rich condition, you had too much fuel and not enough O2. So the car runs rich. When it runs rich, there's too much fuel in the combustion process. It's going to turn the spark plugs black. When they turn black, it starts to misfire. It doesn't burn all the uh, uh, hydrocarbons in the combustion chamber. They start to leave the combustion chamber right, out the tailpipe, and they start to elevate. That's why we call it a follower gas in this, in this situation. It's going to follow, follow, I mean, by going, going up right behind the CO because it's running rich. It's going to follow the CO. Always determine the root cause of the failures. Always find the root cause of the problem. For example, if a vehicle's fuel pump keeps keeps going out, one of you, I mean, I say going out, I mean it's defective, going bad. One of your next steps is to check the fuel pressure. And I had this happen on the escort. Think about it. a car comes in, no start. They can actually use an ASC test. A car comes out, comes in, lack of power. A hard start. You check the fuel pressure, and it's bad. You change the pump, and the car runs great for two days, if two days. It comes back the same problem again. Again. You put another pump in it, because you think it's a defective pump. Same thing happens again. Now, now this time, you check the fuel pressure after you put the new pump on. Before, they check the fuel pressure before the new pump. When they first initially diagnosed it, and they seen the pressure was bad, but they never checked it afterwards. So now, since this pump keeps going out, they check the pump after they put the new pump on to see the fuel pressure. Now they see a dead head pressure at 75 PSI when it's supposed to be 35. And that's killing the pump. Fuel restriction, right? That's killing the pump? No, not restriction. It's too much pressure. Too much deadhead pressure. Okay. It's called deadhead pressure. Think about this. A fuel pump can so pit out... Huh. Right? Say it again. That would be a regulator? Yeah, fuel pressure regulator, yes. A fuel pressure reg regulator is supposed to bleed it off, and it doesn't. Uh -huh. It stays closed. If it stays closed, you'll see constant... You'll see the full... Potential of the pump. Potential of the pump. For example, when a car is being diagnosed, when you're diagnosing a fuel pump, there's a check called dead head, dead head fuel pressure check. If you can do this, what you do is pinch off the return line for a second and watch the fuel pressure. And what you're doing is preventing the fuel from going back to the tank. The fuel pressure regulator job is to maintain fuel pressure across the injectors right. and bleed the excess off back to the gas tank. When you pinch off the return side, it goes to a dead head fuel pressure check. That's putting out the maximum pressure that pump can put out. And usually it's double, a rule of thumb, is double what the running pressure is. Not all cars, because TBIs is low. They don't do that. Yeah. Some, t some, G some GM TBIs won't go that high. Some of them on their low pressure systems. But anyway, so when you pinch the return side off, so it's supposed to double the running pressure or more. So imagine that the fuel pressure regulator is plugged, is, is closed and never bleeds off the 
and never bleeds off the excessive fuel. So it stays at the pump. So the pump is constantly getting all that pressure, all that pressure. All right. And eventually it's going to, it's going to go out because that's too much pressure from the system. It's called a, it's called deadhead fuel pressure. Right. And a pump, and a pump went like technically gave burn itself out. And, but you're right though. The fuel pressure regulator is supposed to bleed off the excessive pressure back to the gas tank. When it's stuck closed, it doesn't do it. All right. But in this case here, the root cause of the problem, why the pump kept going out, going out is because the fuel pressure was too high. And it kept killing the pump. A good example would be a vehicle comes into the shop with multiple codes and there are multiple components not working. Look for something in common with those components. For example, you can have a blown, a blown fuse could take out more than, more than one thing. See if they are related. A ruptured fuel pressure regulator. Hard start, cutting out, bad gas mileage. Or it could be, could be due to a fuel pressure regulator. A shorted sensor. Can, stop, can have the car, uh, can prevent the vehicle from starting up, right? We're going to look at, on the ASC composite vehicle, we're going to look at that. You can have a short sensor causing the car not to start up. A no start condition where there are no foul bulbs, check for a short sensor that is affecting multiple components. It is not enough just to replace a failed component without determining the cause of the failure. For example, if an O2 sensor is replaced and a new one fails within 5 to 10,000 miles, the root cause of the failure was not identified. For a example, it could, it could be burning oil, antifreeze could be leaking on it, somebody using silicon uh, glue for their gaskets. Perhaps a cooling system leak combustion chamber caused the positive to form an O2 sensor. Fixing the cooling system leak will fix the root cause of O2 sensor failure. An O2 sensor, an O2 sensor, and the catalytic converter could both suffer from the coolant leak described. Now, in, in this case, I assume it's because the the O2 sensor gets coated and it becomes lazy, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. It gets it gets coated, contaminated. And affects its operation and becomes lazy. Yes, you're right. That's exactly right. Refer to the scan tool data that read that read incorrectly while the malfunction occurred. So, so the situation would be like we did earlier. We looked at the scan data on that back pressure problem. All right. I got a car with no. I have a car that no power. Drive the car at the speed it has no power and watch the data. That data can tell you could tell you what's wrong. I'll give you a clue what to look at. Like, like we did previously on that last, on a couple of slides back on a, on a plug exhaust system. It may also be wise for the technician to check any monitors that previously failed when the fault occurred. Right? You might have a monitor that failed. You might use mode 6 or see if you've got any pending codes. Research normal operating systems of the vehicle and technicians should be familiarized with the normal operation of the system. And basically all this is saying is you can't diagnose a system you don't know how the system works. So going into the ASC test, try to understand how each system works. Right? That will help greatly to figure out a question they may ask you. Understand how the systems work they, they, they are going to be talking about. One like we're doing right now, OB2. We're going to talk about field trim. Understand how these systems work. Again, like I said before, everybody think the ASC test is off that composite vehicle. It is, but they have a lot of questions that's based off OVD2, electrical, right, uh, uh, engine fundamentals, ignition system. You have to know that. You have to know that also. Apply this information to the customer's concern to determine if the malfunction exists with the concern. 
If the concern has been duplicated and determined to be a malfunction, note the conditions present that cause the concern to occur, such as the amount of time the vehicle has been driven. Sometimes you gotta drive the car for a while before the problem happens. Sometimes it starts in the morning when it happens. When it happens, sometimes they can say they say happen at low speed versus high speed. All right, I'm gonna show you later on the schematic. I mean, on a, on a scan to data, how you can tell if the problem is idle versus high speed. Because on ASC test, they can actually either one. A good example would be on some Hondas, or not just Hondas, any car that sits in the sun and won't start. You push it in the shade, let it sit there in the shade for 10 minutes, it starts right up. So you know that's an electrical problem. All right, that would be an electrical problem. So clues like that on the test, like like I always say, anytime I take the ASC test, I tell it, and I tell my class this, the clue is in the question, right? So you got to understand that question they're asking you. Like example, a car the car starts up in inside a garage, but when it parks and sits in the sun, it won't start. To me, that sounds like an electrical issue. What could it possibly be? Say it again. What could it possibly be? Oh, we had that plenty of time. That's a relay. That's the power. That's Honda's relay. It overheats. Yeah, it overheats, and the contacts, and the contacts off the circuit board break open. All right, it breaks open and loses the contact to the fuel pump or injectors. I think it's the Honda's PGM FI relay. I think it's called. I actually seen on GMs where a relay goes bad and heats up, and the fuel pump doesn't, and the fuel pump doesn't work. That's, that's just heat, especially on a cheat relay. But this is just heat. This is just temperature related. Load. Does the does the fuel trim indicate a problem under load? Does the fuel trim show a problem only at idle, or very little load? Okay, so that's a difference. High speed, I got a fuel trim related problem. Low speed, I don't. Or vice versa. All right. At low speed, I have a fuel trim problem. At high speed, I don't. They are two different situations. Remember, if I'm losing, if I'm at 55, 65 miles an hour, and my fuel trim says I have all air, I know to look for something relating at 55 miles an hour because my fuel delivery is not right. But yet, if I turn it around, the problem is at idle, but now at cruise, right, I got a command for more air at, for more fuel, I can't command, I don't know how to say that. I have a command for more fuel at idle, but not at cruise. That's not like a vacuum leak. Next one. Uh, I got a misprint here. It says uh, the RPM signal erratic doing. Oh, that's what it is. Is the RPM signal erratic during the problem? During the problem of the, current, of the occurrence? No, that's like a vehicle speed sensor acting crazy. Does the problem occur at an increased speed? For example, like a power hesitation. Like a mass airflow. Identify any abnormal scan tool data readings. They may help diagnose the vehicle. If a vacuum solenoid is not controlled, controlling vacuum, as it is supposed to, inspect the vacuum hose and solenoid ports. Remember, like EVAP solenoid, EGR solenoid, they have to receive vacuum to it to work. It doesn't matter if the computer command it on and off correctly. If it's not receiving the vacuum, the part is supposed to be working is not going to work. But guess what? You might get a, you might get a cold in, on the AC test. They might give you a cold for. EGR or EVAP solenoid. But remember, the computer just turned off and on look for a response. If it's not getting the vacuum it's supposed to be getting, it's not going to respond. So the DTC could be set because of an electrical problem from the PCM, or open the solenoid, or vacuum related, mechanical problem, like a vacuum leak. Or the holes are hooked up wrong or plugged off. Yeah, so, and so if the vacuum solenoid is not controlling the vacuum as it's supposed to, inspect the vacuum hoses and solenoid ports to see if they have been tampered, uh, tampered with and unintentionally plugged. That's what I said earlier. 
Now here's another, a cooling system may be disconnected or may have a resistor added to it. It's get more performance. It will, this will actually increase the fuel for better performance. Make the car run slightly richer. So I so said this kind of this kind of tampering may be uh, misguided to improve drivability, but it will harm fuel economy and emissions. Similarly, inspect the throttle position sensor for obvious misadjustments or modifications. This type of tampering is usually this type of tampering is usually used to fix a rough idle condition. Now, that's, now here's the thing on this one. This TVS adjustment. On this, remember, sometimes they try. A car has a rough idle, and somebody might somebody might try to turn the TVS to try to smooth the car out. If they go up or down, above or, above or below specifications, either way can call, cause the vehicle to run rich or lean. For example, let's say it's supposed to be 0.5 volts at idle, and somebody adjusted to 0.1. That car now is going to get a lean input signal, a low TVS signal, to take away fuel. So this can force the car to run lean. And same thing if it goes higher than normal. If we have 0.5 and I got 1.5. It's gonna get a car. This gonna get a the piece is gonna get a vehicle go more fuel. In this case, it might even surge. In both cases, it might cause a surge of uh, uh, hesitation, because it's either above or below specifications. And remember, remember the PCM sees that it's going to add fuel or subtract fuel. Remember, the PCM only sees uh, input signals. The only way the PCM knows what's going on in the physical world is by sensor input. So if that input is wrong, you're going to give a wrong command to an actuator. Part of troubleshooting for an electronic control system is to inspect if a missing damage or tamper component just as any other vehicle. I said this already. Ensure the vacuum lines are correctly connected and free of damage. Uh, that, that could be from heat also. Also be sure that the wiring harnesses are properly connected and free of damage. Now here's the other part. Corrosion. Now, I know the ASC test on the, on the ignition on the ignition side of the test Corrosion can cause the car to misfire. All right. Now, what I mean by that is that if a car, say, the ignition coil had corrosion on the terminal, like Ohm's law says, increase resistance, decrease amperage. Okay. So now, if I got corrosion on the terminals of the coil, that means that coil doesn't charge all the way up. If the coil doesn't charge all the way up, doesn't I say? I should say, if the coil doesn't saturate, that's what I mean by charge, if the coil, ignition coil does not saturate like it's supposed to, under a load that requires voltage that's built into that coil or the ignition system won't be there. So the complaint or the question for the ASC test might be, under a load, the car has a misfire. At idle, it's fine. What can cause this? Tech A says this, Tech B says that. Corrosion on an ignition coil, ignition coil connector can cause that because it never fully saturates. So under load, that required voltage is supposed to be there, will not be there. And that's when the car starts to misfire under load. The other question is, keep in mind, corrosion is resistance. And increased resistance will increase the voltage drop and cause the circuit not to operate as designed. It's like a, it's like a fuel pump. For, let me give you, show you something really quick. Here's a quick example of Ohm's Law. It's 12 volts. Now, I'm, I'm going to draw a light bulb. Okay, but that light bulb is low. It could be anything. 
Now, it's 12 volts, 4 ohms on this circuit. Right? According to Ohm's law, there's 3 amps in this circuit. Okay? It's actually 3 amps on this circuit. Now, if I do a voltage drop across this light, according to Ohm's law, 3 amps, 4 ohms, it's a 12 volt drop, which in this circuit is supposed to be a 12 volt drop because that's, that's the only load in the circuit. Okay, now, if I, if I have a situation when I had a bad ground, it's a bad ground. Now, that ground is in series with this 4 ohm resistor, but that ground is now 2 ohms. Now you can't. Rem now you cannot measure. You, 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 you cannot measure ohms. On, you cannot measure resistance or corrosion of ohms like this. I'm just doing this for this example, for the principle of this. Now take this away. Oops, put that back. Now before it was three amps, two ohms, and twelve volt drop, which was normal. With resistance or corrosion. I had this in line and this in line. Now my total resistance on this circuit is six. Increase resistance, decrease amperage. Okay. Now my voltage drop across this light is now two amps, four ohms, eight volts. So that means something else robbed this circuit of voltage. So that's a light. So this light would be what would happen to this light in this situation with this resistance like this? I got eight volts down across it when it's supposed to be 12. It's going to dim. A dim, exactly. So let's take that light out. The same, the same problem, but now I have a fuel pump. The same situation is up here, but standing being on light, it's a fuel pump. What do you think happened to the fuel pump? They're going to drop. And I have a code DTC P0171. Low, low field pressure? No, a lean. This is a lean code. Okay. Oh, this is for O2 sensor. This is for O2 sensor. No, okay. O2 sensor lean. And nothing, there's nothing in this code points out to corrosion. The only clue is in the question, all right? I would say my fuel pump has a drop of eight volts. As soon as you see this, and it's a member, use it in a circuit, no matter how many wires you see, it's usually only one load in the circuit. So according to Ohm's law, that one load should use up source voltage. If it's only using eight volts, it's me. That means I have corrosion somewhere else, and this, and the intended load is being robbed in this case of four volts. So it's being used somewhere else. The, it's like that rule I say in class. Right, it takes one volt to it takes one volt to push one amp through one ohm resistor. So voltage is pressure. So if I got resistance somewhere. I need that voltage to push the current through a resistor somewhere in that circuit. And that's why I took it from the fuel pump. So back to this, that's how corrosion can affect the circuit. Does that make sense? Yeah. It says here, if the component locator manual and a wind diagram can be essential to determine if a part is missing. If a vacuum cylinder is not controlling your vacuum as it was designed to, to do, you would need to inspect the vacuum lines and the solenoid ports to see if they tamper or intentionally tampered or plugged, like we said before. Mm -hmm. Another example would be an engine cooling temperature sensor that is or has a resistor added to it. I just did this. I went back with that now. I almost went backwards.
As another example would be an intercooling sensor. I think I did this. Another example is a spectral throttle. We did that. Uh, this, what's this one? Locate the relevant service information. Okay, it says talk to the customer and see if there's any recent work performed on a vehicle or aftermarket electronic accessories have been installed. An example would be an aftermarket radio. Install the aftermarket radio to a vehicle. You hook up your scan tool up. Your scan tool goes black and won't communicate. Because the aftermarket component, the way they hooked it up, the ground circuit is affecting the electronics on the car. Cause the scan tool either go black or will not operate or will not communicate. If the customer starts audio equipment or a cellular phone has been installed, those components may be the source of electromagnetic interference that could affect the control system, EMI. A poor ground connection or a power source for an accessory can cause problems with the vehicle's original electronic equipment. Review the relevant information for the powertrain control system for a fast and accurate diagnosis. We're going to go over the wiring diagrams, the flow charts, and trouble trees. Go to that later on. Some systems have a default or limp in operation mode that can't that let the system continue to operate by using that backup values from its own memory in case of sensor failure. And basically what this means is when a sensor goes out, you get a code for it, it goes into a backup mode, a limp home mode, which the, which the injectors is fixed to a predetermined number. And the car will still run and have poor gas mileage, may lack performance, but it will still run. That's limp home mode. That usually happens when the light comes on. Some fuel injection control systems have a clear flood operation. In this mode, the ECM reduce or cut off the fuel flow. And basically what, and basically what this is, here's the combination. Let me see here. Here's the combination here. We had clear flood would be a low cranking RPM, say 200 RPMs, and a high TPS voltage. I used to see this on ASC's tests all the, some, sometimes also. In the combination, car comes on the tow truck, no start, a hard start, and they show you a snapshot. On the ASC test, they show you a snapshot of a scan tool of the no start condition. You see 200 RPMs cranking, right? You see the injectors may not be, may not even be turned on, but you see a high TBS voltage. These two combinations here indicate I'm in clear flow mode, right? They indicate a clear flood mode. And basically, basically the computers turn off the injectors. It's like back in the day when you had a carburetor car and flooded over and you held the gas pedal to the floor. That's to clear it out and fit air in there. The same concept. Adaptive memory features vary from one system to another. This is feature is the ability of the ECM to learn the operation of the of a particular vehicle and to compensate for age and engine wear. And basically what this is, adaptive memory, is what the long-term fuel trim does to adapt for short-term fuel trim. we we'll get into that later on, to maintain a balanced air fuel mixture. That's one of the things adaptive memory uh, can do, can do. Resetting the adaptive memory with applicable is a key is a key step in many service procedures. But note this also: some vehicles may experience reliability issues for a short amount of time until the PCM relearns. The car may stall out, may hesitate, may have a hard idle. The PCM has to relearn relearn again, so know how to control the IAC valve and the injector pulse with. And usually, it just drive the car on the freeway like five minutes, right? They just need to relearn the procedure again or the driving condition or the way the customer drives. To diagnose a, number five here says, use the appropriate diagnostic procedures based on available vehicle data and service information to determine if the available information is adequate to proceed with effective diagnosis. In other words, 
follow a logic a logical procedure right just don't guess at it on the AC test first you do the same thing follow a diagnostic logical procedure a lot of guys fail the AC test because they go on what they did in the shop and that will guarantee you get you to fail on the AC test because they wing it on the AC test they want to know do you have a diagnostic do you, can you do you have the ability to follow a diagnostic procedure like a flow chart or a sequence of your events? Understand the root cause. Assessing reliable repair service information is essential in any diagnosis, including the parameters and criteria to set ATTC. Also, do not overlook reviewing any TSBs that could be related to the problem. For example, a car comes into the shop, P0420 code. Catalytic converter or P0430 for the catalytic converter. The customer changed the catalytic converter. A shop changed the catalytic converter and the O2 sensor, and the code still keeps coming back. Right? They're sitting there beating their head on trying to figure out why this code for the catalytic converters keep resetting. But nobody never checked the TSBs. On the TSB, it says brief flash the computer to take care of codes P0420 or P0430 but nobody never checked it. So part of the procedure of diagnosing is check, talk to the customer, also look up TSBs. Technical, TSB, technical service bulletins. Determine the current version of the computerized powertrain control system software and any updates are reprogramming. Like I just said, some computers need to be reprogrammed to fix the problem. Performing software updates is generally performed key on engine on. As the battery voltage is critical during reprogramming, be sure that all accessories and especially daytime running lights are off to prevent unnecessary drain on the battery. And also prevent voltage spikes. If you if you're sitting there, if you're sitting there reprogramming computer. You don't want no voltage spikes. You want a battery charger on the car, a battery maintainer on the car. All right. Don't open up doors, turn radios on, because you get a voltage spike. That can damage the PCM. Many manufacturers do not recommend connecting a standard battery charger while programming, as voltage fluctuations can cause the reprogramming process to fail and possibly damage the ECM. Special charges have been developed to provide a constant DC voltage with little or no leftover AC voltage from the wall outlet. Be sure the battery is fully charged before performing any reprogramming procedure. If a full battery and charging system test may be necessary to ensure that the battery voltage will, may, will remain at least 12 volts during the programming process. Yeah, you don't want the battery to go dead. Okay, next thing it says, research an OBD2 system operation to determine the enable criteria for setting and clearing dynamic trouble codes. Now, here's the important about this one. It says, determine the enable criteria for setting and clearing dynamic trouble codes and malfunction indicator lights operation. And what that means is that if you want a monitor to run to test the circuit, you're going to need to know the enable criteria to run that monitor. It's not just driving the car around the block. All right, some cars have to be driven in a certain sequence. All right, you want the monitor to run, and anytime I say the monitor to run, that means test the circuit. Okay, or if I to test that circuit, you have to meet a name criteria for the monitor to run. And you have to meet the name criteria for the monitor to run also to fill the car to turn on the check engine light to see if the, if the problem still is there, if the problem is actually there. And some and sometimes on a quick overview of what that is, sometimes it's idle on the car, accelerate to a certain speed, then accelerate to another speed, and decel and let it idle again and turn the key off. If that sequence of events is not followed, whatever this monitor is, it won't run because you didn't follow the sequence of events. And that's why that's why you get a they might ask you a question on the AC test saying 
that a car constantly comes in the back with the check engine light. But every time you drive the car, or sorry, every time the technician drives the car, the light never returns. The technician who's driving the car may not be running their narrow criteria to run the monitors to test the circuit. So he never does that, it will never run, the light will not come on until the customer drives it. When a fault has occurred that causes the emission levels to increase 1.5 times the federal limit, a DTC will set and the mill will illuminate. That's why the light comes on. Only time that light comes on is for the emission related failure. That's it. That light does not come on for anything else. It only comes on for the emissions related failure. Certain conditions such as a catalyst damaging fault, a severe misfire for example, may cause the mill to flash. To test the operation of the mill, just turn the key on and confirm that the mill illuminates for approximately two seconds. This, ver this verifies the mill light and the circular operational. And when you start up, it goes out. Not, at least you know the light is working. Because the reason I'm saying that is that somebody can have a problem, a diagnostic problem with no codes. Is the light on? The light may not be on. I mean that the bulb is blown out. A DTC that is set in the ECM indicates that a certain test has been run and failed. That's what I said earlier. That means a light has ran, I'm uh, sorry, a monitor had ran a test and it failed the test. Remember before that mill light can illuminate that a narrow criteria has been met, a dry cycle or trip has been performed and a successful test has run. And here's an example. The Kellen converter monitor may require a specific driving condition before it will run. This usually, this usually in, includes completing the oxygen sensor monitor first, followed by driving at high speeds of 55 to 65 miles per hour for at least 10 to 15 minutes under light load and no conflicts with other monitors. For example, the EGR, O2 sensor, EVAD. If there's a code relating to any of those monitors, or if those monitors are running at the same time, it would, may suspend the monitor from running, or sometimes even stop it from running. If, like, example, the O2 sensor monitor is not working, failed. And no fault occurs that could affect the accuracy of the test. Example one on the right, it says, where's my pen at? Says here, here's example one. The Kelly converter monitor will not run until the oxygen sensor monitor has run and completed successfully with no faults found. I think we said this earlier. Now, basically what this means is, do you understand what this means? This one paragraph right here? Yeah, it, it, it means that the, it has to go, the system has to go into closed loop, right? Well, yeah, it has to go, it has to go in closed loop. That's correct. But... It has to go in closed loop, that's correct. But the key here is also that the Kelly Converter Monitor, the Kelly Converter Monitor works off of the, uh, the front O2 sensor, right? It compares the two. So if we have a code for the front O2 sensor or that front O2 sensor uh, is defective or lazy, it affects the, way, it affects the test for the Kelly Converter. Right, so if I have a code, like say down here, it says O2 sensor. If I have a DTC for O2 sensor, the Kelly Converter monitor may not run. If I have a lazy O2 sensor, the Kelly Converter monitor may fail. Okay, that's what this means. It says the Kelly Converter monitor will not run until the O2 sensor monitor had run. So in other words, the O2 sensor monitor has to run and pass before the cat monitor will run because it relies on the front O2 sensor to run to test the cat. It can't, it can't test, it can't give a reliable test result if I have a DTC for the O2 sensor and I need that to use it, and I need that sensor to do the test. That's what this means up here. So it means it's gonna suspend that test until this problem is fixed. 
The vehicle must be driven in stop and go traffic condition at five different cruise speeds from 25 to 45 miles an hour at least 10 minutes or more. So when it sees this, this condition here, it will run the Cali Converter Monitor. Example two, the Cali Converter Monitor runs after cruising at 55 miles an hour for 55 miles an hour for minutes. Oh, that thing. Oops. I should be 10 minutes. A Cali Converter Monitor on some cars runs. The Cali Converter Monitor runs after cruising at 55 miles an hour for like, it's like five to 10 minutes. I forgot to put that in there. Some Cali Converters, they just run at cruise speed for five, 10 minutes and the monitor runs. That's all it needs. So for every, but there's different scenarios, but they always remember just something can stop that monitor from running. Diagnostic chart should be of, uh, diagnostic chart should be information about should show you information about the DTC, such as condition necessary to run the test, the narrow criteria. Right again, as we just went over, the narrow criteria, what conditions causes the DTCs to set. Now this is really good. They can, when you find a chart that tells you this, or even your, even on ASC test, they give you what conditions that can cause a DTC to set to set and the condition necessary for the test to pass are clear the DTC. For example, I think on the composite vehicle on the NC chart, that booklet, it gives you a range. I think I'm, if I remember this correctly. Yeah, it does. Come on. So here's an example. Like a, let's say for the coolant sensor. This is the operating range. This is what this means. From here to here. Operate from this parameter to this parameter. That was the computer wanted to see. That's the range. That's the range. If something happens in here, Right, it may 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 not set a code because it's in the operating range, or it may glitch for a second and go back within the range, within a within the parameter and not set a code. But it's looking for anything but below this. Let's say it says uh, it reads low. yeah point one volts and set a code. Anything below this are above 4.5, says so reads 4.9 or 5. It will set a code. Anything above anything above 4.5 or point five or below 0.5, a code TTC will set. Cause this is the operating range here and here. It's looking for a code, it's looking to set a code below 0.5 or above 4.5. It's just a rough example, but in the middle of this, but in this operating range, it may not set a code. Of it glitches, like so. Oops. Uh, if it glitches, like this, this line, this line is supposed to dip when it warms up. I'm oh, sorry, start from here. I got, I got to reverse. I should have had the 4.5 on top. From reverse, it just comes down as it heats up the voltage keeps going down towards four point four point I mean uh, point five. Right. But but if it does this and glitch and goes back, this right here might cause a drawability problem, but it may not set out a light because it stayed in long enough. And it's in the operating range, it might not even fail the test because it's in that range. But this below below this Point, sorry, below this 
are above this 4.5, it looks for that to set a DTC or fail the monitor. So basically, this is what, this, what this means. It looks for it looks for something to pass or fail that test. It's all programmed inside the PCM. So it says the diagnostic chart should be inform information about the DTC, such as the condition necessary to run the test, and name criteria, what conditions caused the DTC. See, like this, what condition caused the DTC? And the condition necessary for the test to pass and clear the DTC. So that's what that was a rough example of what that what the statement means. Interpret the OBD2 scan to a data stream, diagnostic trouble codes. Freeze frame data, system monitors, monitor range indicated, and trip and browse cycle information to determine this to determine system condition and verify the repair effectiveness. Basically, we said this earlier, read the scan tool, understand the freeze frame, understand why dynamic trouble code was set, the trip drive cycles. The data transmitted to the scan tool from the ECM include both digital and analog values. Digital parameters are often called switch parameters or signals that either on and off, high or low, yes or no. You, you usually see this on the output side, by turning a, a person on, it says yes, or uh, on, or uh, off, right? That's a switch voltage. I'm gonna explain that to you later on when we get to the uh, composite vehicle, go, the ASC composite vehicle go, uh, wiring diagram. An analog, parameter, an analog parameter provides a single value, value with a specific minimum to maximum range. That's basically what I just said, I just uh, drew on that uh, coolant sensor. These kinds of data include analog voltage readings, speed signals, temperature readings, and frequency ranges. They all have they all have specific range they need to operate within. And the job of the PCM is to determine if it's within that range. When it comes out of that range, that's when drawability problem happens and DTCs are set. Dynamic trouble codes, DTC. That's when they are set. Like when it leaves that range, the operating range. Every item of data transmitted from the ECM to a scan to has specific value or signal range described in the vehicle specifications. All right. These scan to readings must be compared to, specific, to specs to identify a system fault. And that's what's important about that blue composite pamphlet. Because sometimes you take an ANC test, you have to go back to that pamphlet and look it up. You can't remember all that. That's why it says good to get familiarized with that pamphlet because it's a lot of spe specification in that pamphlet you literally have to refer back to by that clock is running. Yeah. So, yeah. Not, so not being familiar with it and searching for it could be a problem. It, e it eats up your time. Mm -hmm. Scan to readings that identify an open or shorter circle are among the easiest to recognize. See, like it's, that's easy. I got a sensor above four and a half volts, that say five volts, I probably got an open circuit. If I got a sensor that says zero volts, I probably got a short circuit. And you get a cold for either or. That, that's simple, that's easy. The problem is, if I'm in between the parameters, like I showed you earlier, and it glitches, and the glitch don't stay there long enough for the PCM to pick it up, but yet you still have a drawability problem. How can you catch that? A lab scope or scan data, right? You record the data. A resistive sensor displays a scan to a reading at or near 5 volts reference voltage on, the, on which most sensors operate. The sensor circuit to the piece ECM is open. Do you understand that? If the resistant sensor displays 5 volts on your scan tool, it means it's an open circuit. If the scan tool voltage are such a if a scan tool voltage for such a sensor that near zero volts, you had a grounded circuit. So it means like the first one, there is, it's not grounding, right? So that's why you have the five volts present. Now when you said not ground, what do you mean by that? Well, you wouldn't have a ground, like a, a voltage drop. You, you need a voltage 
you need ground for a voltage drop to happen. Right. Right. So you're missing ground. Yeah, that, that could be a reason. Yeah, to see five volts. Anything else for that for that five volts? And yeah, you could be uh, uh, a short to power. It depends on the circuit. That yes, that could be also. That also depends on the circuit also. So look at the, let's look at this one. This is the ECM slash PCM. Now this sensor says so the coolant sensor. It pits out five volts. And it looks for a voltage drop on the other side of this fixed resistor. On this side of this resistor, it's looking for a voltage drop. Let's say this is, let's say this is the ECT right here. It's looking for a voltage drop here. Has this thing heats up from a cold start. And it's watching inside the computer, some called internal comparator or voltmeter. It's watching the voltage drop on this line the ground, mm -hmm. right? It's sending five volts out. So if this sensor, it's, I should do it like this. I don't lose everything. If this sensor had an open in it, and I should have drew it like this. So if this sensor had an open in it, let's see, me my bad drawing. Say here, what would the computer see? It's gonna see five volts. It's gonna see the five volts. Because it, it's an open and didn't drop. That open could be anywhere in this circuit. It could be right there, the same thing. It's gonna see the five volts. It can't drop because there's no path to ground like you said earlier. There's no path to ground. Oh gee. There's no path to ground. It's gonna see only supply. Yeah, exactly. It's only see supply. And that open can also be in the sensor itself. Right? The sensor itself can have an open in it. And guess what? It's only gonna see supply voltage. Now Again, this is the signal line here. That same question that says, how about if it sees zero volts? Well, it's the same thing. Not the same thing, but this, this five volt line here could touch the ground wire or ground anywhere. If it touch ground, guess what? It's not gonna see this five volts. This five volts is gonna be pulled to zero. So now instead of seeing any voltage, it's gonna see ground voltage, which is zero. That's a short. So the open indicates an open circuit. The five, sorry, the five volts it sees indicates an open circuit. And a zero volt indicates the sensor or signal wire is poured to ground, ground somewhere. Either touching ground or touching the ground wire or just shorting the ground. Like I said, those two are easy to identify. The one that's kind of hard, like I said before, that's operating parameter, right? This is four and a half volts. And this is 0.5 and a code only sets you get a DTC either here for open or DCC here for a DTC here for shorts that's when you get the code that's this right here I just I just described but if this sensor starts off a high voltage code and it warms up and it's supposed to come down as it heats up and by instead of coming when it's coming down at one point it does this then goes back here again and this and, and sells back out this glitch if it don't stay there long enough you won't get no DTC but you get a drawability problem gotcha. but you will get a drawability problem no DTC but a drawability problem and how you catch something like that like the, like the slide says if the customer complains about it happening while it's cold start the car when it's cold hook your scan through to the car and draft and record the readings off your coolant sensor, IET sensor, RPM, uh, 
TPS map sensor and see if any of those sensors glitch out while from a cold to a hot operation. Scan reams of the ECM input and output signals reflect values as processed by the ECM. Remember, the output is what the ECM is attempted to do based on the input signal. Remember that. You got input, processing, output. An output signal is enhanced to the computer. It's doing what the PCM says to do based off of an input signal into the PCM. So if I have a bad input to the PCM, my actuators, which is the output side of the PCM, is going to do what the PCM says to do. If it says it can give it more fuel, it's going to give it more fuel. If it says to load the idle, it's going to say load the idle. It's going to say raise the idle, it's going to say raise the idle. If it does it at the wrong, wrong time based off an input, it's going to do it. And it's your job on the ANC test to figure out why. What input is causing this? Like a great, here's a, a very common example. You got to you have a you got to say on the ANC test they say you got a situation where has no start, but you have a you have no injector pulse, no injector trigger, and no spark. The most common thing for all three of those things is a poor input from the RPM signal. You have no RPM from the crank signal. Your car is not going to have none of those things. Those three things I just named are outputs. The RPM is an input. That's the most common thing. Like when they talk about tests, like ASC tests or any other tests. In some systems, a sensor failure will cause the ECM to ignore the signal from the failed sensor and operate in a backup, backup, backup mode, backup values stored in its own memory. In the case that the ECM may transmit the backup values to the scan tool in place of the failed sensor signal. And any particular scan tool data reading does not make sense in relationship to a particular problem or symptom, the system or component should be tested directly with a voltmeter, ohmmeter, oscilloscope, frequency camera, or other test equipment. This is what I mentioned earlier. Here's an example. A car has a charging system, charging voltage on a scan tool of 22 volts, but the barrier says 13 volts. Obviously, sharing? huh? Say it again. Are you sharing something on your screen? Yeah, you don't see me? It says the scan t on a scan tool it says 22 volts, right? But charging voltage, oh. right? But on the uh, on your scan tool, I'm sorry, you go to the battery and check it. It says 13 and a half. What's supposed to be? So obviously that's a problem within the PCM, a ground circuit to the PCM causing this. So this I says go directly to the part. I see 22 volts on a scan tool, I'm going to the battery. If I see 9 volts on a TPS sensor, on a signal wire, I'm going to the TPS signal wire to check it. That should be pretty, they should be pretty close to each other. Maybe a tenth off, but they should be a pretty close to each other. There should be no way 13 volts at the battery and 22 volts and 22 volts on a scan tool. Or the TPS signal says 9 volts on a scan tool. And it says point, and it says uh, one volt at the at the sensor on the on the car. That means that PCM has an issue, or has a grounding issue at the PCM. Okay. That's why it says verify with the with the components. And remember, a scan tool also is like your vis a visual representation of what the computer is seeing coming into it and going out from it. You can see it through the scan tool. It's just your eyes are to what the computer sees. But a, a voltmeter, a ohmmeter, or a oscilloscope is a tool you need to go check the part. Now, don't get me wrong, sometimes you can use a scan tool also helping your diagnostics. But to confirm the part is not working, you need to go to the failed sensor. Right? Because now, now it's not being processed, you at the sensor itself.
The OP2, the OP2 system mounted virtually all its emission control systems and components that can affect the tailpipe of evaporative emissions. Again, emission related, 1.5 times higher if the light comes on. If the system component exceeds the emission threshold, the fails to operate with a manufacturer's specification, a DTC will be stored and the mill light will be illuminated. Within two drop now here's the point here, remember this. Within two two driving cycles, meaning if it fails one time, you get a pinning code, no light, and no freeze frame. It's just in memory. If it fails twice, the freeze frame comes up, the light comes on, telling you there's a problem. OB2 system monitors for malfunction either continuously, regardless of the driving mode, or non-continuously once per drive cycle during the Pacific drive modes. A DTC is stored in the ECM when a malfunction is initially detected. In most cases, the mill is illuminated after two consecutive drive cycles with the malfunction present. Once the mills are illuminated, three consecutive drive cycles with outlet malfunction detector are required to distinguish the mill. The DTC is erased after 40 warm cycles once the mill is distinguished. That means that if the light came on, if the light came on and you fix the problem, you drive the car off of form three good trips or drive cycles, the light will go out, but it will still be in memory. And this is what I do at the schools also. Some shops also do this. The car comes in, the light's on, you fix the problem, and don't turn the light out. Let the computer turn the light out. If it's fixed, the light will go out in three consecutive trips when it doesn't see, when it doesn't see a problem. But guess what? It's still in memory. This is good for a failed smog too. The way you can smog it after this also. If you clear with the scan tool, you have a hard time smogging it because you can reset the monitors. But anyway, it's still in memory. It's going to take, like it says here, 40 warm cycles to erase it from memory. Distinguish from memory. So any of the light goes out, it's still in memory for 40 consecutive warm cycles. Examples of standard diagnostic information are freeze frame. Uh, hold on one second, my daughter just texted me. Re examples of standard diagnostic information are freeze frame, data inspection, maintenance, re readiness indicators. Let me say that again. Here's an example of a standard diagnostic information are freeze frame, data and inspection, maintenance, readiness indicators. This is for a small. When they check this, even the maintenance indicator uh, is set to pass a small check. Keep in mind, if the monitor has not run, the circuit may not have been tested. Okay, so the monitor is sub. It doesn't say set, ready, or done. Right, if it don't say set, ready, or, if it doesn't say set, ready, or done, that means that the monitor may not have tested that circuit. Freeze frame data consists of parameters such as engine RPM and load, state of fuel control, spark, and warmer status. This information is stored in the ECM at the point of the malfunction is initially detected. However, previously stored conditions will be replaced if the fuel or misfire fault is detected. And that's basically saying here, basic saying that if a you have a code for EGR and while you're driving, say like two or three days later, car gets a misfire. That misfire monitor and freeze frame goes in priority than the EGR. You probably see the freeze frame for that and not the EGR. That's what the statement means. OB2 inspection maintenance range indicators show whether all OB2 monitors have been completed. Test results can be displayed to show whether all the OB2 monitors have been completed. The readiness indicator does not indicate if the monitor has passed the test. It just indicates the monitor ran a test. So on the readiness test, all it's going to show you that it ran a test. When it says complete ready or done, it don't tell you it passed the test. 
Check and see if the amount of pass after a repair is a great way to verify a repair fix on the vehicle. So basically, if I got a problem with the EGR valve, and it comes in, you fix it. You clear the codes. You run a dry cycle or trip until that monitor runs for the EGR. The monitor runs. So when the monitor runs, you know it's been tested. You can confirm the fix by going back to the EGR, uh, go, sorry, go into the EGR monitor, mode six, or go into pending code to see if there's a pending code for EGR. Right? If there's no pending code for the EGR, or if mode six is clear, that means that's a, that means that's a successful fix. You fix the car uh, successfully. So using a monitor to pass a re to confirm a repair is a good way. It could be part of your diagnostics also. It says to check to see if the monitor passed at the repair is a great way to verify that the repair fixed the vehicle. It's basically running the monitor to the monitor says complete. Then go back and check my pending code on mode six to see if there's any pending codes or how well did it pass the test in mode six. That's what that means. All right, we're gonna start right here.